Hello everyone, today is Thursday, September 14, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everyone here for taking time out of their busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence, so thank you. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions as usual. Your questions on trading. Your favorite stock picks, picks, he's easy for me to say. If you don't mind, hold off on your stock picks until we get to the live charts. And that's for your benefit, just so I know uh, I don't accidentally delete the, the question about a stock. And then also ask about one stock at a time. That way I'll know whether or not I covered it. And again, that's also for your benefit. So what do we talk about? Well... I want to kind of get back to the methodology and the money management a little bit. I've been, I know I've been kind of going off on trading psychology quite a bit, and that seems to be my big focus over the last uh, few years. But I want to get back to talking about performance and the portfolio and such. And this week we're going to focus on improving performance through discretion and swing trading around core positions. We have two live examples on this, and I think that's going to make a lot more sense in a minute. Very timely issue. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. If you want to go to my website and read it, feel free to do so. I could sum it up by saying all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, before we start talking about discretion, I always get questions about what's the difference between discretion and micromanagement because they sort of seem the same. Discretion, you're sort of breaking the plan, right? And and micromanaging, you're sort of breaking the plan, right? Well, you are breaking the plan. Well, there's a big difference. With discretion, you're using your brain to generally improve performance. Now, it could be a damage control situation. It could be taking partial profits when the stock is very, very, very close within spitting distance of the initial profit target as I'll show here in just one second. And you're not really aborting the plan. What you're doing is you're making these little minor tweaks. Again, you're using your brain. You're not drifting too far away from the core methodology itself. If you got a brain in your head, you might as well use it. Now, Probably the best definition of micromanagement is abandoning the original plan in attempt to outsmart the market. And the thing about micromanagement is it can often pay over the short term, but never longer term. And by the way, you can't put yourself into a potential state of regret by looking at a market and saying, oh, uh, I've got all these profits but I'm not going to micromanage myself out of them because Dave said not to and then watch them erode while following the plan and then get upset because you didn't take the profits. So you can't put yourself into that state of regret. It's interesting that today I said, well, we're going to talk about the methodology and focus on the money management. But they really all are all three intertwined like a three stranded cord, pun intended where you can't really talk about one without the other because the money management has a very big psychological aspect. As I say, quite often people say, hey, Dave, is your money management psychological or statistical? And my answer to that question is yes. And when we get into it, maybe I'll flesh out a little bit of that. But keep in mind that micromanagement can pay over the short term, but never longer term. If you micromanage yourself out of a position, let's say you decide, well, I don't want to let that profit evaporate, so I better take it, that might work 10 times in a row. You might feel pretty good about that. And then the 11th time, you miss the mother of all winners. So keep in mind, as I preach, and some of you guys might recognize this slide, I actually went on my YouTube channel and dug around for some slides until, until I found this one. So there's a lot out there. But the point is that the market can often be a really, really bad teacher. And that's 
why you see me focusing on the psychology so much. And trust me, the market has played games with me before, and, and I've been there, done there, done that, and got the T-shirt on a lot of these bad behaviors. And my educational business serves as a constant reminder for me not to do these things because of two reasons. One, I see a lot of people making the same mistakes, and it reminds me not to do them. And two is I don't want to become a hypocrite and come out here and say, don't do this and don't do that. And then when I'm tempted to do those things, I can hear my, my own little voice in the back of my head saying, don't do that. And hopefully, hopefully the voices in my head aren't bothering you guys too much today. All right, let's talk a little bit about using discretion when you have a position that is closing in on the initial profit target. So a few days ago, we had this stock set up. And I don't have the original entry and all the setup in here, but the original entry was 750. And you can see the stop was two, and the initial profit target was 950. So if you take away two points from 750, your stop would have been at five. And let's take a look at how that shook out. So that's the entry. I'm sorry, it's 550. I don't know what I said a second ago. That would have been your stop. And then if you remember how the money management works, it's one for one on the first loaf or first half. So you take this measurement here. And then you add that to the entry and bring it up here. And that gives you an initial profit target of 950. And you can't see it in the spreadsheet, but up here it says initial profit target. And that's where it is right there. So the stock triggered and then made a nice little run up towards that initial profit target. Now, on this day here, I began to tell everybody, look, we're getting fairly close, so keep an eye on this thing. And then notice here it came really, really, really close. In fact, yesterday it was in within four, four cents of the initial profit target. Now, I got some emails from you guys saying, hey, hey Dave, I, I listened and I didn't split hairs and I took partial profit. So congratulations on that. Now, I'm going to flesh this out in a little more detail in one second when we get to the next slide. But what we're looking for here is a 1% move. Now, this is a hypothetical 100K account. And, again, I'm going to flesh this out in the next slide in a little bit more detail. And we're looking for a 2%. I'm sorry. We're looking to risk 2%. So that's $2,000 per trade. So if we divide that by two, we're looking for that comes out to $1,000 on the first loaf. Now, you're not going to get rich if all you ever get is the first loaf out. But as you'll see in the next slide, it can help to keep you in the game. So when it starts getting fairly close to that initial profit target, seriously think about locking and loading and locking that profit in. Now. Don't get in and by the end of the day be up like $100. Let's say you're up 100 bucks, and you're looking for $1,000 on the initial profit target, right? Don't exit on that day or the day after when you're up maybe 150 bucks, if that much. But if you're up $950 bucks or $975 or just a few cents away from that initial profit target, then by all means, feel free to take it. Now, as I was going live with this presentation, I thought about a couple things on how do you know that you should take it. Well, one, obviously, if you're getting this close, that's close enough. Okay. Number two, if the move happens fairly quickly, so let's say uh, one, two, three, four, you know, within, a, within a, a week or so, if it gets there, especially if it gets there like in three days, two or three days, and it's not quite there, then it's okay to lock and load. And the reason is because that market has become overbought really fast when it goes up over several days. 
So as long as it's pretty much a route up towards that initial profit target, even if you're not quite there, it's okay to take partial profits. Now, in the tracking portfolio, anything that's highlighted is still open. So this position is still an open position on both the swing trade part and the longer term trend following part. But Dave, you just had to use some discretion. Well, the reason that I track it mechanically is to one, help the beginners to see it unfold. And number two, just so there's no confusion about the methodology. Now, again, with discretion, we're doing a few small minor tweaks to improve upon the methodology through common sense and using our brain. But to avoid confusion, and I told you so, or whatever you want to call it, hindsight, in the portfolio that I publish every day, I keep it mechanical. But then sometimes I, to a point of almost whining and begging, I tell everyone to use a little discretion. And I kind of try to give you a heads up when discretion is uh, out there. By the way, if you're not in my Twitter account, if you're not following me on Twitter, make sure you do that. You can get the links on my website for that. And usually I'll put out a tweet right around here or here as I did yesterday or the day before when it was nearing that initial profit target, just to remind you. And I was talking with a client yesterday, and it's like part of me thinks, well, maybe I should make it official and say let's get out officially and all these things. And I was talking to my wife a while back, and I started telling about all these different things. And it's like you can't do everything for everyone. You just got to – sometimes you just have to put it out there. And she's right. You know, eventually you're going to have to take the leap of faith and actually do these things and exercise a little discretion. So, But I think by showing you them over and over and beating a dead horse on these things, I think eventually it might begin to sink in. So as I was saying earlier, if you had an account – and I just use 100K to keep the math easy – and you're risking 2% per trade, that's if stopped out, then obviously you're risking $2,000 per trade. And that gives you a $1,000 initial profit target. Now, the real money is in the longer term trend following. And as you can see here, and this one was up over 200% not too long ago, now it's up 190%. A little bit more with today's action. So that's better than the poke in the eye. But this is this is why we here. Th these are the ones that we've been waiting for, at least the one we've been waiting for. And one or two big trades can make your year. And if you think about that, 8,000 and change would be 8%, again, to keep the math easy. And that's just in one position. So that can make all the difference in the world. Now, the reason we take the partial profits is because we don't know that that position is going to turn into the mother of all positions. Now, as we'll see in the next slide, you can occasionally use a little discretion, and I don't know if you call it discretion, but kind of like an add-on technique to actually swing trade around that core position to help squeeze out a few extra bucks. But the initial swing trade, so to speak, meaning that you're taking those partial profits, that helps to keep you in the game. That's not our ultimate goal, though. If all you made was a swing trade profit longer term, you would probably not do so well. And the reason is because even with short-term trading where your risks are fairly well-defined, something bad can still happen. And if you make it to where your losses are relatively limited and you're going in with a fairly small share size on that swing trade and you're taking that swing trade profit and then trailing a stop and allowing for that potential home run on the second loaf, then you're making as much money as possible and when, not if, you get spanked for more than you intended to risk, then at least you made some money to help make up for that, or in a lot of cases, more than make up for that. Now, let's talk about swing trading around 
the core positions. So getting back to the portfolio, let's say you've taken that partial profit off and now you're with a half a position left, okay? Well, if the stock sets up again, you could put on some additional shares and then flip them out again for a swing trade. Now, we're not trying to get rich doing this, but we're just trying to squeeze out some additional profits. So this is what that might look like. Suppose you had a pullback and you decided, okay, I'm going to enter here. I'm going to put a stop down here. And then I'm going to take a partial profit here. Now, let's keep the math easy and say you trigger in, and in this particular case, we, had to, we happen to buy 200 shares. Then when it hits that initial profit target, you're going to flip out 100 shares, and then you're going to trail that protective stop higher. Now, this is my ultimate goal is to get a what I call a free position, quote-unquote free position. Because barring overnight gaps, the worst that could happen to me is I'll scratch out on the remainder of the position. So from a psychological standpoint, remember earlier I said the money management is psychological and statistical. But from a psychological standpoint, I could view it as a free position. And I've got to come up with a better way of saying this, but I've been saying that for years. You're sort of playing with the market's money at this point. It's still your money. But for me, psychologically, it's a lot easier to sort of forget about a position and let it do its thing once I've already taken some money off the table and once I know that I'm in a position of strength. Now, let's say that that stock sets up as a pullback once again. Well, then once again, we can look to enter if that trend begins to resume. So we could put back on 100 shares, and then we could flip out 100 shares when it hits our initial profit target. So instead of just making the money that we'd make on a longer-term swing trade, I'm sorry, longer-term position trade, we're able to get a little swing trade out. Now, again, you're not going to get rich doing this, but it can help for you to make a little money along the way. And then again, if things work out, then you can just sort of rinse and repeat doing this over and over again. Now, I've kept it easy with put 200 on, take 100 off. In reality, as it moves more and more in your favor, that stock price is going to get higher. The volatility might increase, as I've said before. And if you go dig around my website, you could probably find some good presentations on that. I say so myself. But if we get it just right, when the market begins to take off, the volatility will also take off with it. So this stock here is different than this stock was back here. So in reality, you might be putting on a smaller share size. And by the way, people often say, well, Dave, when you ca capture your best trends, your positions are always at their smaller size. So that's, that's flawed. Well, actually, it's not because you're taking risks off the table and you're mitigating your drawdowns, helping to mitigate your drawdowns. And the other thing too is, depending on the price of stock when you get in, but if you get in at a fairly low price, like the Kimmon example we're gonna look at in just one second, then you've got on a fairly sizable position, even at a half of a position. And 2% is, is enough to hurt. It also adds up pretty quick. If you get hit a few times at 2% before you know it, you're going into a bit of a drawdown. So 2% is a number to work up to. And I think it's a little harder to make it work with any number bigger than 2%. And it's still going to be a sizable position on, even at a half of a position. Now, the point I was making earlier is, well, we can't see it on this chart, but the... Kemet trade, let's see if we got the portfolio here. Let's go back one second. Talk amongst yourselves. 
So on the Kemet trade, you can see you got in at 680 with only a point and a half round number risk, okay? Oh, that's probably supposed to be PGR. I must have uh, fat fingered that. It's progressive. I'm always thinking progressive PRG, like uh, abbreviating, but it's PGR. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. And minus one is a short position. We can take a look at that in just a second if you like. But you can see that there are, that's a substantial amount of shares, 1,200, 1,300 shares, round numbers at six. Then you flip them out, then you got 650 shares, round numbers. That's still a lot. That's a lot of shares, especially once the price goes up in value. So as far as I'm concerned, 2% is plenty enough. All right, let's get to the next. So here's Kimmet again, present day pricing, at least as of last night. And you can see that it's been in a pretty serious uptrend. So what you would do is you'd say, okay, well, let's get in for a new swing trade. And that would be your entry. And that would be your protective stop. And then that would be your initial profit target. So if it rallies up and triggers, then this would be your stop on that those add-on shares, and this would be your initial profit target on those add-on shares, and then you would flip them out. Obviously, it got there. Somebody was asking me yesterday, well, why not buy while it's on sale? Well, you don't know if it's going to keep dropping in here. And what's amazing is, as I think I said last week, and I'm doing some work on trading psychology, which is just becoming this massive project. And one of my goals has been to go back in and read all these vintage texts or reread all these vintage, vintage texts on trading psychology going back 100 years or more. And one that I read last week, by the way, it is sold in S-E-L-D-E-N. You can get it in public domain. And like I said last week, I bought the 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 PDF or whatever you call it, the Kindle for 99 cent. And it's worth having it. That way you can cut and paste and get the quotes out of it and such. Well, what's amazing is even in the Livermore book, which I can't, I don't think I'd be able to find on the fly, but just to kind of paraphrase, some lady was asking Jesse Livermore if uh, he thought the stock was a good buy. And he says, yes, but only if it's above 22. And she's like, well, why not buy it now when it's at 19? And he said, well, I don't know that it's going up. But if it goes to 22, then I know it's going up. And that's it's kind of interesting. There's nothing new under the sun. And that's why I used to always preach about entries and said, well, at least you know it's going up at that particular point in time. It might stop going up five minutes or two minutes or one minute after you get in. But at least you know the moment you get in, it's headed in the right direction direction and it's funny you know you go back and and you could see throughout the years a lot of other people had said the same thing but then you go back and find that livermore said the same thing and what's even more fascinating is you can go back even further and find people saying the same thing i'm i'm uh, listening to a book now 50 years of wall street where it's they're talking about trading in the 1800s which is kind of kind of fascinating talk about around the the Civil War time and all. So, but a lot of things they're saying go back in time to, to even then. So, as was said in the Bible and also in Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, there's nothing new under the sun. And last week, by the way, I, I talked about standing on the shoulder of giants. And I think I'm going to flesh that out a little bit. I might have a piece ready on that tomorrow. So, keep an eye on that. So anyway, now we have a new setup in Kim. Now, a couple of points on swing trading around core positions. Your litmus test is going to be, if you were seeing the setup for the first time, would you take it? So if you're seeing a stock that's in a really nice trend like this pulling back, you have to forget about the fact that you already own it. 
Now, there's a, there's a whole behavioral finance or trading psychology or whatever you want to call it that comes into your existing positions. And it's been proven the longer that something is in your possession, the more attached psychologically you become to it. So you have to be somewhat antiseptic when you're looking at an add-on position and say, okay, if I was just seeing this setup, would I take it? And my own personal litmus test is when I'm going through my charts and I'm going, I'm banging that little mouse, or not the mouse, but the space bar, going through chart after chart after chart, chart after chart, 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 and all of a sudden, bam, a chart pops out like Kim did yesterday, KEM. I'm thinking, wow, that looks great. Oh, that's Kim. So that's a good litmus test too. It's like if you see the chart and you really like it, and then you realize after the fact that it's a stock you're already in, then it's probably worthwhile going after as an add-on trade. Now, obviously, money management is key. So you do want to honor your stop on that new position, obviously, and take those profits off. We're just going in, try to scalp off a little bit, so to speak, a little bit more than a scalp, but just going to get a little bit off and improve our bottom line a little bit. This is not to get us, make us rich. This is just to help make a little bit more money, squeeze a little bit more out of the trade. Okay, Donald says, low volatility and high price share stocks can result in large position sizes in terms of dollar values. Do you ever consider the maximum dollar value of your position in your money management approach? And the answer to that is yes. And that can, but you probably never see it because usually I'm not going to trade a low volatility stock that's super high priced because I just the main thing is I don't like low volatility stocks except on occasion on the short side. We'll take a look at that PRG. I forget the name. Is it PRG? Anyway, we'll take a look at that in just one second. I have it in the portfolio. I actually did a presentation on that, and I don't think I could find the, the, the GIF in a, in, a, in a jiffy. But I actually did a presentation where I showed that lower volatility stocks can actually be more risky. I was talking about that in TC chat just this morning. Because you're going to have to trade more shares. And if you poke around YouTube channel, you can find a presentation where I showed a spreadsheet where we were using like an eight point stop on a $44 stock, if memory serves. And my calculator is busted. I can't pull it up quickly. But if memory serves, you ended up with like more than half of your account in it if you were using like a one point stop or something like that. So, yes, with lower volatility stocks, you could end up with a bigger portion of your account in them uh, usually in those cases i might widen that stop out a little bit and just trade fewer shares so that helps to guarantee a capture of trend but as a general statement because of that what you're pointing out because you have to trade more shares because they're lower in volatility to make the math work they can actually be more riskier as i wrote in one of the special reports better the devil you know, and if you go to my website under free reports, uh, you can download that special report on that. Okay, but yeah, that's a good question, and that's a good point, and that's something that usually I don't have to worry about too much. But there are times that uh, technically, yes, we would have to worry about those things. So let me see if I could find it for you real quick. If you go to my website, and I'll make you walk through the gift shop first. You click on store, or shop now, I should say, which will bring you to davelander.com slash store. And you go all the way down to the bottom, you'll see the free report. So grab the one that is, if I can figure out which one it is. Oh, there it is. Um... Right here, why you should trade inefficient markets. 
And then there's another one in here too that covers that. But start with that one. And then also look on my YouTube channel. Read all these if you get a chance. Would you wait for closer to the close before buying? No. To make sure it's still up? No. And the reason you, you wouldn't do that is because a lot could happen intraday. Let me get the, um, let me get a chart up, or let me just get a blank screen up. So, what Howard's saying is, would you wait like towards the close to buy? Now, I do have some buy and close patterns, but that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about mostly the core methodology. So, let's say you have a, it's not a great looking. Let's say you have an entry here and then intraday to stock triggers. Well, you don't want to wait until the end of the day. It's like, well, I'm going to wait till the close just in case it comes back here by the end of the day. The problem with doing that is sometimes when you get triggered, they'll just keep on going. Okay. And then you come the next day. So what are you going to do? You're going to buy it way up here. You're going to chase it higher. It puts you in a position of making extra decisions. So, if you could say, I'm just going to get at this level and do it, your life gets a lot easier because you're making less decisions, okay? So, no, you wouldn't want to wait until the close before that occurs. Now, if you're doing something, one of my IPO, there's a couple of IPO uh, market on close patterns that I have, but that's a different story altogether. And what we're doing there is, is let's say we're looking for um, a new closing high. So what we're doing there is we're waiting to make sure right before the close that it's going to be a new closing high, okay? So that's a, a little bit more of a breakout characteristic type of trade. And keep in mind on these type of market on close trades, we're a bit of a pioneer. We're trying to get, er get in early. We're not waiting for that secondary setup that looks more like this, okay? That will be trade more like the core methodology. This is what I call a pioneer trade, okay? So those are two completely different things. You know, I don't know if you have the, the IPO course or whatever, but go in and watch, rewatch it. If you don't have it, go to the IPO page, trade IPOs, and watch the video that I did there. I uh, probably should redo it, but the information hasn't ch changed. I've thought about redoing it, but there's nothing new uh, that I put in the um, in the intro video. But go in and watch that, davelander.com slash trade IPOs. Twenty five to fifty long is a double, but a short of fifty to twenty five is only fifty percent. That's correct. But on the short side, you can not, if, not quite as easy, not that it's easy on the long side, but on the short side, you still can trade around positions, okay? And on the short side, maybe it might work a little bit better. The math might work a little bit better because you're getting it at lower prices. You might be able to, I don't want to say leverage it up a little bit, but you might be able to actually put on a sizable second loaf or maybe close to the half of what you're putting on as opposed to the long side as the price gets higher and higher and higher and you're doing these add-on trades then let's say you put on what was it 1300 shares let's just say 1200 keep the math easy and you flipped out 600 well way up here you're not going to be putting on 600 shares that's just too many shares based on the price of the stock but if you did just the opposite here if you were short 1200 and you flipped out 600 then maybe you could put on 600 and in some cases maybe even slightly more depending on how math works out shares to the downside so you can and i don't want to use the word leverage but for lack of a better word you will have a little bit of leverage on the short side that you won't have on the long side now shorts are a pain in the ass i'd much rather trade the long side so this is going to be a lot tougher than this over here on the long side 
But yeah, that's one of the downsides to the short side is you could only make 100% on the short side maximum. And as I preach quite often, I mean, there's other problems too. There's logistics, there's borrowing, there's callbacks, all these things I preach about so often. But the reason you want to short, as I'll probably touch upon again, because we've been talking about the upcoming bear market, is because of the obvious reason. Obviously, it's the only way to make money if the market goes down. But the more, or I should say the less obvious reason is that it helps you to see both sides of the market. As I've said quite often, I talked to one of my friends recently who's a, who's a long only money manager and he was pretty bullish. Well, that's no big shocker. He's usually always bullish and he's usually always right. And as he pointed out, markets go up 80% of the time. So that's probably not a bad way to bet. But we do have the occasional bear markets and the people who I know, either through their charters or for their own personal reasons, who are long only oriented, tend to always see the glass as half full. I'm sorry. Yeah, half full instead of half empty. And I've talked about that quite a bit, especially in trading full circle. So I would recommend you short, but not just for the obvious reasons. All right. Lately, I've been talking about winter is coming. And if you guys are watching Game of Thrones, I swore I would, wasn't going to bother with that because I try not to get caught up in a TV show. But a buddy of mine said I had to watch it. And he was right. It's pretty awesome. Anyway, that bastard Jon Snow has been talking for, what, six, six seasons, six years about winter is coming. Well, there were quite a few signs a few weeks ago that winter was coming, but what happened? The S&P made all-time highs this week, as did the NASDAQ. Now, the Russell, that's a little bit different story. We'll talk about that in just one second, but it's not too far behind. So is winter still coming? Absolutely. Absolutely. The one thing I can guarantee you with 100%, and I can't guarantee much in this business, but I can guarantee you that there will be another bear market. Now, we don't know the exact timing of that, but we pay attention to the signals and the signs. And as a good little trend follower, we're just going to follow along as long as the market continues to bang out new highs. And a lot of the problems that we saw a few weeks ago, or a few months ago now, I guess, have sort of work their way through the system. And then keep in mind that new highs will beget more new highs because people are forced out. I've talked with somebody a couple of years ago, had a lot of uh, their retirement in the market, and they thought the market was too high, and they got out. And I haven't talked to them over the last couple of years, but I would imagine that every time the market makes new highs, He's probably doing that mental calculation in his, head, in his head on how much money he would have had should he stayed the course. And he's probably feeling a little pressure to get back in. Well, obviously, once everybody turns bullish and everybody's in, that's going to be the end of the trend. But it's better to be safe than sorry. And as I often say, and I quote Greg Morris quite often, but he once said that we treat all signals as, as if they will become the big one. I've written extensively about this. So if you get a sell signal, you want to pay attention. It might not be the big one, but you want to pay attention. And sometimes you get out the way. And that can be frustrating. Well, he visited Christmas before last, and we were talking, and I told him that I, I often quote him on that big one thing. And he says, well, you got to realize that Whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. And you could survive a whipsaw. It sucks, but you could survive it. But you can't survive a bear market, at least if you decide that you're just going to buy and hold and lose half or more than half of your money. By the way, just a little uh, heads up here. I'm writing a tell-all book about what happened 
during the last bull and bear markets. And that's a sneak peek of what it looks like. So it's probably going to be a short book, uh, two pages. <laughs> All right. Let's hop into the uh, live charts. And any questions on anything we talked about so far, feel free to ask. Um, I keep forgetting the slides in here. Trading Full Circle, if you want to start watching these videos, you can watch for free the introductory videos, which there's a lot of good stuff in those introductory videos. I was saying to myself, I had to go back in time. I would give myself these first four videos, and that's why I, I scripted them as I did, and say, okay, you're going to get this down pat before you decide to move on. And you're not going to go on a grail hunt unless you – can do something simple first. And that's uh, something else we're going to write about, I think, on Friday. So go to this. This is the link right here. There's a link on my homepage that, this, uh, that looks like this video here. You can click on that to get in. But it's the number two, then trade-stocks-successfully. So those of you, I think most everybody here has already been through it. But, so thank you on that. What else? I think we've kind of beat the dead horse in these announcements. Anything, any unanswered questions for those who are new here, Dave at DaveLander.com, or you could also click on the contact form. All right, let's go to live charts. When you compare market returns to income from job, it is time to lighten up. I don't necessarily agree with that. You know, the problem, you can't, you don't quit. You follow your system. And if your system says, hey, I'm in the stock and I've got a thousand shares and I'm up five bucks, then I take that twenty five hundred dollars off and I leave the remainder position on and then I continue to follow. The hard part for a lot of people from a psychological perspective is that you really have to be a greedy bastard on your winners. And I know it's cliche, cut your profit short, let your winners ride, but you really have to let your winners ride. The Kimmick, for instance, is, is up 200%. Now, how often do you get a stock that's up 200%? Not that much. I could probably count on my hand the last stocks we've had in the last few years that have made such big moves. Quite often, you don't even get that much, right? But you might be thinking, well, how much is enough? It's never enough because you you always will have losses. You always will occasionally have losses bigger than you intended. You always will make mistakes, and most of the time, the mistakes will be against you in this business. Every now and then, you make mistakes in your favor. You can't let it go to your head. You got to say, okay, well, that was stupid, but I made money. I won't do that again, even though I made money. Again, the market would be a bad teacher. But if you quit at 200%, you never make 400%. If you quit at 400%, you'll never make 800% or 1,600% or 3,200% or 4,200% and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, those moves will come along every day, but you want to position yourself for when they do, and you want to make as much mo money as possible when possible. So there's no need to lighten up, but – have a chair ready, absolutely. And if your system says lighten up, then by all means, lighten up. All right, let's go to the live charts here. We're going to start with the um, S&P 500. I guess before we do that, somebody was asking about the PGR. Is it PGR? Yeah, it's PGR. I don't know. What do I have in the portfolio with us? PRG? Yeah, uh, it's PGR. Okay, so my apologies on that. Um, remember I said shorts are a pain in the ass, or if I haven't, I should have. Nice little first thrust set up here. All-time highs, nice little slide, a little bit of a bounce. Okay, and this was the entry was 44. Stop was 49. Like Howard's pointing out, yes, a sizable portion of your portfolio is in the trade. 
but you'll get that money back as the stock drops, or if the stock drops, I should say. So this is a nice little first thrust setup. Now remember, the first thrust, you don't sit around and wait for that market to have a nice deep retracement. You're forced to get in fairly early, so you're missing that potential reversion to the mean move. And the, the beauty of it is, if it works right away, then everybody gets caught off guard. And I'll show you an example of, the, of what I'm saying. It's a similar pattern, but a similar, um, along a similar vein. Anyway, so it triggered and the stock went straight back up. Well, it hadn't stopped us out yet. And so far, it's come down and filled the gap. So what are we going to do? Well, let's just follow the plan and see what happens. Longer term, that's the thing to do. Shorter term, no, micromanage yourself out. Get out of it. And you might be thinking, well, you can always get back in. No, you can't. No, you can't. Because tomorrow, if this thing opens at $28 a share, you've lost your position. You can't get in. You can't get back in. Maybe if you're trading a 24-hour market, but then that has its own problems, obviously. And fast moves can still occur, even in markets that trade 24 hours a day. So, no, you can't get back in. And it's kind of interesting, once again... I keep coming back to the wisdom of Livermore, and he's talked about having positions on where he feels like he knows it to go against them, but his position is still valid, and he might take a million point swing, a million dollar swing against his position, and he's okay with that. Yeah, Jim. Jim's asking if PGR is a gatekeeper. Sort of. Um, I wouldn't take a gatekeeper with a gap, okay? But Dave, why are you still short? Well, because we're following the plan. Those are two different things, okay? You look for perfection going into a trade, and then you get what you get, and you don't throw a fit once you're already in the trade. So right now, if the stock stops us out, it stops us out. So be it. Drop an F-bomb and move on. But no, I wouldn't trade it as a gatekeeper because of the gap. I don't like this the way it gapped up, okay? And a gatekeeper is that's a gatekeeper is the closest thing I'll trade to an actual reversal, and I don't trade them that often. And I like them mostly on the short side. And I'll just show you what it looks like. A gatekeeper is when you have a market that has a sharp sell-off and then has a quick retrace rally. Usually 10 to 11 days in this measurement from that peak to the retrace. And then you want to see it stall out well short of the prior peak. Now, I'm not a Fibonacci guy, but it just so happens that that usually is between 618 and 786 of the prior high. Okay. I kind of take a not offense but i have a, a lot of the fibonacci people you know fibonacci people like this is what the charts look like you know and then the market goes up and it's like oh look i told you it's good it, 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 i told you it would stop here it's like well okay it doesn't stop here it stops here or here or here so they're always right <laughs> so anyways i'll probably get shot for that all right, let's um, finish up in the market. So that's the PGR trade. Stock market, S&P 500, kind of hanging around these old highs in here. It's always amazing. The market is off to the races, and then it just kind of stalls out after these big, huge runs or big, huge up days. Um. One thing that's concerning is we have been quite sideways in here for quite a while. Just for S&Gs, where is the 200-day moving average? 200-day moving average. That's the five-day moving average. 200-day moving average will soon be right around a support level, which is kind of interesting. 
But as you can see, we've had pretty nice daylight for what it's worth above that 200 for a long while. And we just had that one little kiss back in November. So, so far, longer term uptrend remains intact. Somewhat in the medium term, as you can see, we've gone sideways. Nothing magical. Just if you have TC, hit your C key, grab a point in time and drag it forward. And you can see we've gone mostly sideways for a couple of months in here, two months and change, two and a half months. And then obviously more recent times we're beginning to break out. Now, for me to get excited about a breakout, ideally the market would have to break out and not look back for a while and then have an orderly pullback. And as a pullback guy, I'll be doing what? Looking to play the pullback. So I'd like to see some follow through, some serious follow through in the piece. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ hit brand new highs and closed there yesterday. Today, it's a bit of a shoulder shrug. I don't want to read too much into it. As I often say, don't get too caught up in classical technical analysis. But for now, we have a minor double top in the works. As usual, follow through will be key. And as a trend follower, you'll probably be a little late. So wait to see if it could break out decisively before getting too excited. Now, earlier we were talking about winter is coming. One thing that had me concerned was the Russell 2000 made a bow tie down after hitting all-time highs. And that usually could be fairly significant and ugly. And you can see we did have a pretty good sell-off out of it, but fortunately it turned right back around. It's headed back to new highs or towards new highs. My only concern with it is we were talking about that gatekeeper. Not that this is a gatekeeper, but it has that gatekeeper-ish looking action. Maybe if we take a look at a two-day chart, it might help us see that a little bit more clearly. Let's see what a three-day looks like. Yeah, three-day chart. Oops. You could see that you had a sharp sell-off followed by a retrace back up. Now, I'm not bearish, and I'm not going to fight it. And the other thing to remember here, too, is it's been chopping sideways for a long, 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 long time, all of 2017 for that matter, going back to 2016. One day at a time, but as I've been preaching ad nauseum in the service and in the market in a minute, my big concern is that when you have these V-shaped recoveries at high levels, by the time the market gets all the way back to new highs, it's already overbought when it's trying to break out. So it's hard to mount a new leg on top of an old one like that. Okay. Now, as you would expect, the sector action has improved as of late. With the NASDAQ banging out new highs, you've got some areas like semiconductors, as you can see, breaking out the new highs. That's certainly a good thing. Computer software has been doing fairly well as of late today, notwithstanding. It's just down a little bit today. But so far, so good. Most anything technology related. Now, I've been kind of a bull in biotech, but biotech's kind of lost a little steam in here. So you make sure you just honor your stops on existing positions in biotech. Insurance looks a little iffy in here. But you can see it had a bit of a throwback up. Maybe let's take a look at a two-day chart, a three-day chart. Well... It actually just looks like a pullback on a two or three day chart. So on a one day chart, it just kind of looks like it's stalling out in a retrace rally. So I'd be a, I wouldn't rush out and buy insurance right now. I wouldn't short anymore for now. Well, there's a couple out there that look dubious. Maybe like uh, was it Allstate? You know, you're asking about gatekeepers. I'm sure if you dug through insurance, you could probably find a few that looked kind of gatekeep s ish. Metals and mining has been doing pretty good, but now it's pulling back in. I'd like to see it clear, or like to have seen it clear this prior peak in here before coming back in. I'm not a big fan of buying markets when they're pushing into the prior highs like this. I'd much prefer if they cleared them decisively before they pulled back. And this is why I haven't gone after any metals and mining stocks as of late, even though you've had stocks like aluminium doing pretty good. Now, if I see an aluminium stock set up, then maybe I might take it. 
But for the most part, I'm not that excited about the sector. Now, as a general statement, sectors have been improving as of late. You can see transports have had a pretty good run in here, and they took out their prior little highs. They look pretty dubious going back a few weeks. But now they're kind of a bit of a throwback towards their old highs. Now, ideally, you want to see them going to make new highs so you don't end up with something like a head and shoulders top. You can see bigger picture wise. Now, remember, we don't trade off of this big picture classical technical analysis. We just pay attention to it. And we also take things one day at a time. New highs fixes a lot of problems. Write that down. All right. Let's open it up for individual stock questions. And if you guys want to look at any other sectors or whatever, we can look at any chart you want. Mule on a pullback. Well, Micron's a big fixed stock, but it can trend at times. And you can see it's had a pretty good trend, obviously, in here. Um, I'd prefer if it was in complete clear air. You do have some bad memories back here a little bit. Prior peaks, we were just talking about that. But that's way back in 2015, so I wouldn't be too upset about that. And we did clear this little peak here. So, yeah, maybe on a pullback, put it on your momentum list. But I'm not seeing anything in there just yet. JNC, that's on the Landry list, but uh, we could look at it because it's not a – I think it needs a little bit deeper pullback, ideally. Um, I mean, it looks okay. You've got some bad memories around 22, I suppose, if it got all the way back to 22. But, yeah, that one looks okay. And it would be triggering in today. I guess I shouldn't have covered it because it's on the Landry list. That's a freebie for you. <laughs> Let's take a look at the chem. All right, keep them coming. CLXT. Yeah, this is one I've been watching. Um, this was actually combination of things uh, was a buy it B pattern back here and then also if you take a look at the I don't have an official name for it just yet but Dave light is what somebody said I should call it the five day Dave light pattern which is in my column by the way and then we also talked about it in last week's show I'm going to talk about it once again in Friday's commentary I guess I have to write that now I've been talking about it so much but that would actually be a buy on – which day would that be? This day here based on that pattern because the low was greater than the moving average, and then that's at what we talked about earlier, new closing high. Okay, A little bit more obvious here, as you can see, breaking away from the moving average, closing at a new closing high. So, yeah, wait for a pullback on this one now, okay, since it's had a pretty good run. But, yeah, good eye on that, Howard. HCC for Mr. James. Yeah, in fact, I forgot. This is also on the Landry list. Uh, yeah, I like this one. Uh, nice run higher, and then it didn't pull back enough for me as of last night. But now that we got this little sell-off in here, I'll reevaluate it towards the end of the day. Um, but, yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, nice persistent uptrend. You know, as I said earlier, the best setups, I think I said earlier, I was thinking about this earlier at least. The best setups tend to jump out at you. You can see nice persistent uptrend followed by a pullback. I got a blank chart in here somewhere. There you go. Uh, so, you know, as you can see, let's get the moving average out. If you were to take the stock price out, it's pretty obvious that that's a thrust higher and a pullback. So let's put the price back in. You see, there's a little there's a little trick for you there. Draw your lines and take the stock out. And if it still looks pretty good, then you, you might have something. And then also notice, let's just for S and G's, let's put a let's put a linear regression. Let's see what let's see what a mechanical linear regression would say. Let's go to this day here. Yeah, pretty much right on top of the line I drew. So that's a linear regression trend line. 
And you could see that the reason I drew it is just so it'd be more mechanical. And but you could see that we've got some daylight above it here. There's a little daylight below it here, but for the most part, you have some nice wide range bars above it. And if you let me clean up the chart. If I were to just kind of do my own little trend line here and intersect as many bars as possible, you would actually have more daylight above the trend line, okay, or the persistency line, I should call it, than you do below it. So that suggests that the trend is especially strong, okay? Let me show you what I'm saying there. So what we're doing is we're fat fingering things. So the point I'm making here is let's say you got a market. You want to draw a trend line as through through as many bars as possible. And if you're ones that are outside of the bars or to the upside, that suggests acceleration, okay? So in the HCC, you've got the bars outside the trend line. KL for Donald. Yeah, this is one I've been looking at. Uh, it's a gold stock. I'm not super bullish on golds just yet. But you can't argue with the fact that it's in a, a, a nice trend. I would say yes on a pullback. And again, let's put that uh, let's put our little hand drawn linear regression in there. See, it's kind of I mean if you depends on how you draw it. But for the most part, you can see you've got some nice little daylight above it. Yeah, on a pullback, possibly. With a commodity-related stock, let's take a look at gold itself. James, I'm not going to talk about that one. That's on the Landry list. But, yeah, good good eye on that. High five. Good job. <laughs> Trying to redeem myself in case somebody comes after me. It's out of courtesy to my clients. I'm, I'm doing that. Um, with a commodity-related stock, I like them when they're coming off of all-time lows or at least multi-year lows, maybe 10-year lows. And you'll notice gold, the commodity, made a bow tie coming off those lows. So with commodity-related stocks, I would be more excited about a gold coming off its lows than, than a gold that's in a longer-term solid trend. But as a trend follower, I'm not going to argue with something like that KL. KL, it's in a longer-term trend. And I will – that is in my momentum list. So each day I do the scanning, and if I like a stock – like HCC, for instance, which has been in, coming up forever, I put that in my momentum list, my short list, to make sure I look at it. And then when it begins to set up, or if it's already set up, I put that in my Landry list, which is an even smaller list, subset of everything else. Okay. SMPL. SMPL. No. Uh, now, here's an IPO where you could say, okay, Dave, is this, let's buy this if it breaks out. Well, you could, but here's the deal. An IPO should have some sort of excitement to it. And we'll, we now show you, I'll come back to AKCA as an example. So this looks like a huge, 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 huge range. And there used to be a way to do it. I forget how to do it, but there's a way to get like a 10 point. Is it T? Yeah, no, that's a 100 point. One of these, you were able to get like a a bigger range in here. So that's only a one-point range in an IPO. Now, an IPO should have some kind of excitement to it, okay? So, and that's where a little discretion comes in. If you're following these buy at B type patterns or Dave Light patterns directly, then you'll get something that looks like that. So a case like like that, I would let this one prove itself and then maybe take a secondary setup like the first pullback, okay? Now, 
something like AKCA, the reason I took the buy at B in the Dave Light position here is because you've had a pretty good run in here, as you can see, okay? So, I mean, that's a 50% range or 45% range just on a closing basis. So there's some excitement to it. So you want to make sure there's some excitement. As I said in the IPO course, what's the story, fad of glory, okay? So, and if you don't know the story, then look at the charts. I mean, we always look at the charts anyway, but there has to be some sort of excitement. And you don't have to worry about the story. You don't have to worry about the fad. That's what I'm trying to say here. Just by looking at the chart, if you've got a one-point range and a $10, $12 to IPO over three weeks or four weeks, whatever the case may be in that other one, then the market's not very excited about it just yet at least. But when you see a little IPO come out, a little biotech IPO like this one, and you see it rally 30%, 40% over the first three or four or five days, you've got something pretty hot here. And you've got something that you might want to go after. I M M U. If anybody, if anybody wants a course, let me know. I'll give you a promo code. Make you a really good deal. Um, I'm just, I've actually lost clients, believe it or not. And I'm, I, I think this is also going to be in a column on Friday. I've actually lost clients because of the IPO service. Like people started doing IPO course. People started doing so good trading IPOs that they they abandoned everything else. And it's like I try to tell them, look, it won't always be this great. One day that that bull market and IPOs will end, and you will have you will need to be following, continue to follow along. I should say the core methodology. And then here's the deal too: if you could occasionally catch the Kemet that goes up 200%, that's still pretty good. It's not nearly as exciting as an IPO rallying a lot more than that over a short period of time, but it's still decent nonetheless, and it makes you more well-rounded. It helps balance out things a little bit too. But yeah, I've actually lost clients because it's worked so well, worked a little bit too well. Um, this one looks a little extended, but as a trend guy, I, I certainly can't argue with it. Uh, maybe if it, it, it needs to pull back a little bit, maybe a little bit more of a knockout move. So if you saw like a big knockout move like that happen, I don't know if they'll let me draw it, then I would go after it. But yeah, put it on your momentum list for sure. Okay, IAG, that's going to be a gold stock. And that looks pretty good. Maybe a little bit deeper pullback. But look, we've got a base breakout, okay? Wide and loose, wide and loose, nothing to do here. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit. Let's zoom in a little bit more bit. This rally higher has been a persistent one. This is one of the most amazing things. Look at that. That's beautiful. This is one of the most amazing things that I've discovered over the years. And, and again, I think I'm going to write about this in the column on Friday too. It's like I covered a lot of ground. It's, it's been growing and growing and growing. But I started out grail hunting. And then I found something simple, and I would suggest you do just the opposite, as you'll see on Friday. But my grail hunting nowadays is what's the simplest system or simplest pattern I can create that works? For instance, that little, that little breakout from the moving average on a new closing high, how simple is that? How easy is that to follow? Pretty damn simple, pretty damn easy. But in some of that other research, going back a few years, the discovery of persistency, and I'm sure I'm not the first guy who has discovered it. I'm sure Livermore did it, and somebody did it before Livermore. But it's a pretty amazing concept. So here's a stock that goes up day after day after day after day after day. If all you did was trade persistent pullbacks, I think you would do quite well. Linda Rasky once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. And this is a lot about a lot of what I talked about in trading full circle, especially when I got to the transitional patterns, which are a little bit more involved, a little bit harder to trade, a little bit harder to recognize, can offer a tremendous opportunity, but not nearly as, as slap you in the head with a halibut as something like a persistent pullback. 
So the purist in me would like to see a little bit deeper pullback to maybe like 625 or so. But that's a good looking stock. Nice persistent trend. Nice pullback. Now, let me show you my little magical trick we just showed a few minutes ago. Let's take the chart out. And let's get rid of the moving average because I don't have a blank chart in here anymore. And look at look at how that looks. OK, it's 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 pretty solid, pretty obvious thrust pullback. There was your prior range. Put the chart back in and look at that. So, yeah, that's good looking stock. If all you did was trade persistent pullbacks, I think you would do just fine. But everybody's got to count the waves and do the Fibonacci and the oscillators on things of that nature. No. Is it going up? Is it going down? Um, I'm not really crazy when stocks have a huge gap like this. Don't get me wrong. I like gaps in direction of the trend. But you've got this huge gap here. And then, of course, you've got this big gap down here we talked about a while back. I think in biotech, you probably find something better out there to trade. There's a thin one. It's an IPO right now. It looks pretty damn good. I'm already long, so I'm not going to tell you what it is. But you can find it. And it's set up as a pullback. It's kind of thin, though. It's really thin. Wasn't, I didn't realize how thin it was when I got in. Or it got thinner after I got in, I should say. A little tease there. All right, any more? Going once. Going twice. All right. Quiet bunch today. Cool. Well, obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on your business schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, just daviddavelandry.com. If we don't talk again between now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. I hope to see all you guys again and girls next Thursday. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Howard.